Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Njoroge. Uh, I'm a student at uh, UCT. I'm a master's student. And uh, thank you for coming to my presentation. Um, it's on my dissertation, and it's entitled Design and Implementation of a RISC-V-based LoRa module. Okay, let's just jump right into it. Um, yeah, just a bit of introduction. Um, I was actually born in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and then my family relocated to Botswana, Kaporoni. Um, and then I grew up there. And then I moved to Cape Town, South Africa to um, start tertiary education. Um, graduated in 2020 with a BSc in mechatronics and then went straight into uh, my master's. Um, yeah, and yeah, I enjoy working with embedded systems. So yeah, the presentation outline is as shown here. I'm gonna start with just giving the context of um, what it is that uh, I've designed and where it fits in the world essentially. Um, and then I'm gonna go into the design of the system, both the PCB and the SOC. And I'm gonna look at um, programming it. Um, and then there'll be a quick demonstration and then plans um, for the future. Cool. So yeah. So starting with the context, um, the way that the Internet of Things has been uh implemented, the architecture used from, I guess, the, the inception of IoT was uh cloud computing, and that essentially entailed that um, sensor nodes spread out over a network would be would have the primary focus of generating sensor data and transmitting it to a central location for uh, processing. And um, as time has progressed, um, those applications have become, I guess, more computationally um, requirements. And um, yeah, in, as well as the sheer number of sensors being used, there's, there's been an increase. So what, has that, what, what that has led to is um, a more need for higher processing power essentially um, and also reducing the traffic in the network system so what what has been um, looked at is moving away from cloud computing and into edge or uh, full computing and what that is is just bringing the computational power closer to the end nodes um, yeah so essentially um, this project is a look into um, contributing to that um, shift um, and yeah, so I chose Risk Five and Laura, um, and uh, I'm gonna go into um, both of those technologies. So yeah, starting with Laura, it's essentially a uh, wireless communication protocol, um, and it stands for long range. Um, you can see it's uh, it uh, has distances of up to fifty kilometers, which is um, pretty great for. Uh, IoT use cases. So for example, using it in a smart city system where you have sensors um, spread out over it, over the city. Uh, additionally, some other features that are quite desirable about LoRa is that it's uh, free to use. That's both the network um, usually used with LoRa, LoRaWAN, and also the frequency bands that uh, LoRa chips transmit in you. They're basically unlicensed, which means you don't need to pay um, to transmit in those frequencies. Um, yeah, it's also um, highly sensitive and low power, which is very ideal for um, imagining a sensor network with sensors um, being deployed for multiple years at a time. And um, yeah, it's also designed for low bandwidth to help with that fact. Um, so you can only transmit um, little packets of data, but you are, you are sure that they will be received and um, they can also go over a long distance. Uh, moving on to Risk Five, um, it's a uh, it's basically an open source um, ISA, and that means that CPUs um, designed for the Risk Five ISA are, are shareable. Um, there's no um, licenses or fees that you need to pay to buy or use the CPU, which um, basically has generated a lot of collaboration um, and also research into making the CPUs. So yeah, that's why I chose Risk Five. Um, speaking about the research a little bit, um, there's been sp specific IoT use case SOCs 
um, that have been developed um, and they focus on higher order um, computational that uh, edge computing is looking at. So examples of those would be AI or um, signal processing. Um, and yeah, combining these two, um, Respive Laura, I managed to create the Laura dongle, which is um, the shorter, more catchy name of um, the board. And yeah, essentially what it is, is that it's a low cost, fully open source custom PCB um, that houses a customizable SOC and offers reconfigurable logic. And yeah, now we're going to go into the design of the board and yeah, you know, let's just uh, jump into it. So there's been two revisions, two prototypes that have been um, implemented so far, um, with the second one being fully functional. It's more of an evolution of the first. Um, yeah, naturally with the first prototype, there was a couple of um, issues and errors along the way, but it, it worked for the most part. But um, yeah, there was always a plan to improve it on the second prototype and fix anything that came across. So yeah, um, the changes that were made, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go into it in more detail um, in the following slides, but just the overview is that I changed a couple of the ICs, uh, made, chose more applicable ones, um, reduced the size, also added a breakout section. That's the little bit sticking out at the bottom. Um, that houses a gas sensor, and that's more like a demonstration of applicable use cases um, for this. So an example would be like an indoor air quality measurement thing um, or whatever. And yeah, uh, another thing is that the price, the price difference between the first board and the second board, as you can see, was about like 20 times cheaper. Um, I will explain why later in one of the changes that made, but it was one big change that happened. Um, yeah, so the functional block diagram of the PCB is this. It's, um, I, I, it's quite simple, I, I believe. Um, hope not, but uh, yeah, just to, talk you through it. So starting from the left, it uh, has the USB connector, which goes, um, the USB signals goes into a con uh, converter from uh, USB protocol to SPI and GWART. Um, so that's the FTDI chip. And then um, the SPI goes to a 128 megabit SPI flash that houses um, configuration data for the um, FPGA, but um, it also has the ROM region of the RISC V CPU. Um, yeah, and then um, the SPI flash is connected to the FPGA and CPU using um, SPI as well. Um, the FPGA is a Lattice IS40 um, UP5K, so that's 5,000 lookup tables. It's relatively small in um, the world of FPGAs, but it's 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 enough for a prototype. Um, and then it uh, is connected to a gas sensor using I squared C, and then it's connected to um, the LoRa transceiver, which uh, is from Semtech. Um, yeah, so the changes that were made uh, were the FTDI chip, the package of the FPGA, and the SPI flash. Um, the lower circuitry was kept the same um, because uh, I'll get there, but essentially I wasn't able to test it in the first revision. Um, so yeah, I didn't know what what would need to be changed for the second one. And then um, the final connection is a 16 pin header to the unused pins of the FPGA. That's actually probably um, a, a really good uh, addition because it uh, gives an opportunity to add extensible um, circuitry, extensible applications for um, the, the LoRa dongle as well. Um, okay, so starting with the changes that I made, um, I'm gonna start with the FTDI chip, as I mentioned. So essentially the first revision um, is pictured at the top there and um, that little jumper wires to a breakout board to a USB um, cable is how I used UART from the computer. It was non-ideal. Um, because that would mean oh, it would take two USB ports, but also it's kind of a clunky um, setup. And the reason for that is because the FTDI chip that was originally used was a single channel chip, um, as you can see at the bottom left. So the change was essentially changing from the single channel to a um, dual channel. 
And the chip is essentially the same. It's just that it has now two um, channels. So the UART was passed through that into the USB connector as well. And what that means is when you connect it to a computer using the one USB connector, it shows up as two USD devices, which is which is uh, pretty great. Um, the next change that I made was the SPI flash. Um, it wasn't fueled by anything particularly going wrong. It's more that, um, well, firstly, when I was going back to des design the second revision, um, for some reason, the original SPI flash was uh, out of stock. Actually, no, it was um, obsolete. Um, yeah, but actually when making the slides again, I went back and apparently it was back in stock, but yeah. Um, yeah, so, and then also the tools that we're using, I was using um, support the second flash more than the first one. So like specifically the, the program that um, was written to load the bitstream of the FPGA onto the flash, it was written for the second one. Um, although it was still compatible with the first one, but um, yeah, that, that's what that change was. But it was actually a um, a positive change in, in the sense of the memory allocation. So the first one was about a 32 megabit SPI flash. And the second one, it says there at the bottom, it's 128 megabit. So it's a much larger flash chip that was used and um, basically bigger um, space to work with in, in the firmware writing specifically. Um, in terms of cost, they're relatively the same price, um, about I think it was 30 cents a difference between the two. And then, um, yeah, power consumption is also pretty much identical. So yeah, I think this was a positive change as well. Um, the last main change I made, um, and this is a, a bit of a convoluted change for multiple reasons. So um, I'm going to start with the reason that's shown in the slide. So. Um, the FGA pot that I was using um, basically had about 30 pins to work with. So in an attempt to um, minimize the pins and share some pin usage, I connected the SPI clocks for the configuration of the FPGA, that's the one to the flash, and then the SPI clock that would um, communicate with the LoRa chip. I connected them together and I thought that I would be able to um, reuse the pin essentially. But unfortunately, when building um, the SOC, uh, the error that um, is pictured here shows up and it, it didn't let um, it didn't let me use the two pins um, at the same time or, or rather they were instantiated um, separately. Um, so there were ways to get around trying to tell it, OK, there's two pins and I want to use them but uh, I couldn't get the software to actually make it work. It managed to build, so this error was taken care with, but um, when it came to actually programming or running or doing anything, nothing was happening. So yeah, the change was um, pure by that. And another reason is that this chip is, uh, was the pin, it's a BGA package and the pins are extremely small and close to each other, about 0.2 millimeters spacing between the pins. And essentially what that means is the PCB um, being um, manufactured would need to be, um, uh, what's what's the word? Uh, high, it's a high density PCB. So it's an advanced PCB, which makes it much more expensive, much, much more expensive actually. So changing the FPGA part, um, it, the same chip was used, but this it was a different package. So it went from this um, really small, small pinout um, package to a larger, more um, traditional QFN package. And that just made the PCB now become a standard PCB, gave me more pinouts, which was also used in the 16 pin header and ultimately drove the price down as you saw by about 20 times. So it was $300 for two boards to manufacture without components. And then with the new um, part, it was $25 for five boards. So yeah, a big change. Um, yeah, and I think that's it for the PCB design. I'm going to speak a, speak a bit about the SOC design. Um, so essentially I used uh, Litex, which is an open source Python framework for FPGA designs. Um, it really lowers the barrier of entry for use. Um, and it's, it's actually, it was, a, it was a great experience and um, I enjoyed it. And it has a bunch of um, cores that you would use in the design of an SOC. 
Um, for example, I have the SPI, SPC. Um, there's also things like direct memory access. And then it also has a lot of um, already implemented CPUs. So um, essentially when you're using LightTex, you're just focusing on um, the structure of the SOC. Um, yeah. And then I use Yosis as well um, in Arachnip and our project ISOM essentially that um, open source synthesis um, and um, place and rod tools for Lattice IS40 chips. Um, okay, so this slide is just a visualization of how Litex made um, the, the SOC design much easier than it would have been. So initially when I started the project, I, I thought that I would have to um, use Verilog or VHDL or something to design the, the SOC, maybe even um, writing um, specific cores to do exactly what I want. And I quickly realized that that is a large project on its own, basically um, a whole dissertation, I believe on its own. And Litex uh, made that much easier. Um, so what it is, it focuses on the interconnect between the SOC or the architecture used in the SOC as opposed to um, writing the actual code. And um, it also generates the useful information that you'd need to work with the SOC. So that's um, the C code as well as the tool chain um, specific um, files, so like the link information, um, and also gives you documentation on what the SOC looks like. Um, and then, um, on top of that, there's also already uh, a few open source projects out there um, that use Litex. And um, I was I took great inspiration from two in particular, which is um, the Icebreaker on Litex example and the FOMO. And those are both um, open source FPGA um, PCBs um, that have Lit Litex SOCs as well. Um, yeah, so... When choosing the CPU for the SOC, it uh, that was one of the main decisions that need to be made. And um, how it came about was, in, okay, initially we started by um, just doing simulations or looking at the documentations of the CPUs out there to figure out just how much resources or how big an FPGA um, would be needed. And uh, we, we, we quickly realized that uh, most SOCs or most um, implementations had um, large um, FPGAs and which would drive the cost of the board to be quite expensive. Um, and um, as well as a first prototype, we want more of a proof of concept. So we look for a cheap um, FPGA before um, anything. So yeah, we settled on, on Serve, sorry, um, which is a really small um, CPU that's um, actually already implemented on Litex. Um, yeah, so we use serve, and then as we um, programmed further, needed a bit more um, complexity for the CPU. For example, interrupts as um, uh, we 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 realized that we might need a bigger one. So I just uh, implemented it with Pico RV32 as well, um, which is also used in Litex, and it says they're minimal because it's the minimal variant um, that's specified by Litex, and that's. Um, only mostly because the full version um, was was too large as well, again to fit on the FEJ. So that's that was the choice of CPU. It's uh, Serve or Pico RV. Um, and then the other specifications of the SOC. Um, so just a quick rundown. It's a pretty, I guess, the base level implementation. Just what I needed to get um, uh, a proof of concept down. So um, there's definitely room for improvement and um, uh, massaging, but essentially as the CPU, as I mentioned earlier, and then there's about 128 kilobytes of RAM, and that's used as the dedicated SP RAM block in the FPGA. Um, and then there's also um, eight megabytes of ROM, and that is stored in the SPI flash. So as I said, this the second flash was larger, which uh, also gave us larger ROM to work with. And then there's also just uh, communication cores. I mentioned UART, SPI, and I2C already. And then just general GPIO pins. Um, so there's uh, two LEDs just to show, indicate transmitting and receiving. And then, um, yeah, some lower configuration pins. Those are just uh, things like a busy pin or the reset pins, etc. So this is the block diagram of the SOC. 
Um, it Litex operates with a wishbone bus, um, and basically every um, peripheral or core in the SOC is given an address on the bus. And in order to interact with them, you just read and write at those addresses. Um, so the CPU serves as the master on the wishbone bus, um, and um, it handles the, the transmitting and receiving of um, commands on the wishbone bus. Um, so the GPIO ISPC um, SPI, that section on the wishbone bus is under a specific um, name, which are the CSR registers. And what that is in Litex is um, basically just memory mapped input output registers. So that means the CPU writes to a section on the CSI, CSR section in the wishbone bus that corresponds to um, a register that could be, for example, a SPI um, MISO register. So that's how you'd interact with the peripherals um, with the SOC and uh, using the CPU. Um, yeah, and another thing is that the those registers are also generated by Litex, but I believe that um, I'll explain that uh, later on. So this this table just shows uh, an example of the resource utilization by changing the two CPUs. So for this test, um, basically everything about this SOC was um, kept constant except the the CPU being used. So the only change that was made is the CPU being used. And as you can see with serve the the smaller CPU. Um, less than 50% of the lookup tables was actually used by so and that leaves a lot of wiggle room for uh extensible designs and also using the FPGA fabric um yeah and then Pico RV the minimal variant as mentioned earlier uh, uses a bit more but still leaves a bit um a, a bit of room to work with and then the minute block ram um serve once again uses less i mean half than um, Pico and then the SP RAM is is a hundred percent for both because that was um, predefined um, to use the block RAM. I mean the SP RAM on the FPGA. Okay, so um, now I'm going to look at the code a bit. I'm going to speak about how to generate the SOC and then how to also program it, um, and then I'll show a whole lot of snippets um, just to, to help the explanation further. So yeah, starting with the the SOC um, Python scripts, essentially it's just two Python files that you need to have. And that's the target and the platform. So I'm gonna start by talking about the platform, um, which is essentially just a constraints file for the FPGA. So if you've ever worked with FPGAs, you know that um, with the pins, uh, you basically need to specify which pin is what and um, give it a pin name. So that's what uh, the platform file is, but then it, um, it also has some Litex specific information, such as selecting the programmer and um, selecting the part number of the FPJ that you're actually using. So what that does essentially is um, once, you've, um, once you run the target file, it's uh, as simple as calling one script and then your SOC is built um, synthesized and loaded to the FPGA all, all from the one command run. Um, yeah, moving to the target, as I mentioned, it's uh, now focuses on configuring of the SOC so that um, setting out the different peripherals, um, the different CPUs, any other settings that you might want to have, one might want to have on the SOC. Um, and then it also handles the building and the loading of the SOC as well. Um, so yeah, this is a screenshot of a section of the platform. Um, this is the constraint section. Basically, there's that I.O. list, and it shows that the different pins are mapped. Pin names are mapped to physical pins on the board. Um, yeah, on the FPG, I mean. And then this is a section um, of the platform that uh, basically instantiates um, the part number that's being used and giving it the IOs, and then also um, setting up the program and the ISTOM program, which is the IOSIS um, tools that I mentioned earlier. Here's the target. Um, so this is all the inputs necessary for the SOC as it is now. Um, so you import the various Litex cores and implement and classes that they have. So for example, um, there's the, the SP RAM that we're going to use to use as RAM. Um, there's the builders, there's the programmers, um, and then 
further down, you can see the SPI classes, GPIO classes, etc. And then also the section that I highlighted showing that um, importing the platform that we defined earlier. Um, yeah. Um, looking at the SOC, I mean, at the targets, I'm just going to quick rundown of what it's doing from the jump, from the start, I mean. Um, so, yeah, first it statically defines a memory map that just to ensure that when you change versions that everything is where you expect it to be. And then the initialization functions, first step is to initialize the platform that's been defined. Um, and then the selection of the CPU type, um, as you can see, it's as simple as just changing the keyword key, keyword argument um, that will be passed on to the SOC builder, just changing the name from serve to Pico RV. Um, and then if it's Pico RV, use the minimal variant because as mentioned, the, the, the non-minimal one um, would be too large to fit. And then moving on, um, because the, the RAM and the ROM is being used in special cases for this SOC, just making sure that it's not automatically generated generated and it's forced to zero um, and then setting up the CPU reset address which um, as I mentioned is in the SPI flash so just um, telling the CPU where which address to look at in the flash in order to read the firmware that you will be running um, yeah so that's what the flash offset is and then um, this snippet shows setting up of the memory so that's the RAM and the ROM um, you can see it's as simple as just uh, instantiating the UP5K SP RAM in the SP RAM's case. Um, and then in the ROM's case, you um, pull in the specific um, part number of the SPI flash that you are using. Um, and then just um, adding SPI flash using one of the um, functions that Litex has. And then now setting that region to be the, the ROM. Um, so you set the ROM region and then you make sure that it's at the offset in the SPI flash and then you also set the size. Um, yeah, and that's how the memory is set up. And then just a bit more um, generating of the um, the input output cores. Um, yeah, it's as simple as just uh, setting up a GPIO in class, GPIO out class. Um, this is just a snippet, not all the other um, pins I mentioned here. So. Yeah, there's still the LEDs that need to be done as well um, that have been done, just not shown in here. And the SPI as well is also simple. It's just instantiating the SPI master class that was input. Um, yeah, and then this is the main function of the target file. It's uh, So it just starts with the system arguments that you'd put in just basically settings to configure how you want the SOC to be built or what you want to do. Um, pretty straightforward and then moving further it just instantiates the SOC with the arguments that have been set um, and then um, if you want to build it or flash it that's there that's done as well so as you can see it's everything is taken care of from the building up until the um, loading into the FPGA so now with the SOC built this is going to look at the firmware and basically the structure of how it's um, how to write and use it. I'm going to start with the bottom left, which is the Litex generated um, files. Um, so I'm actually going to focus on the csr.h, and that's basically the header file that contains the addresses of all the peripherals in the CSR section of the wishbone bus. So um, essentially, it's, it's functions that you, you, you use to read and write um, to the peripherals. Um, yeah, and then so the rate, the LoRa driver uses that specifically for the um, SPI communications. Um, so talking about the LoRa driver, so um, essentially the the bottom two files, the HAL file and the non-HAL file, were provided by Semtech. Um, the middle one being um, being fully written and then just the user having to write the specific HAL functions um, for their specific uh, microcontroller or um, CPU that they're using. So what Semtech provided is a um, function prototypes in that have specific inputs and outputs and return types that uh, you need to well, massage or write 
to fit that prototype in order to use the driver um, fully. And then radio.c is just a wrapper that I have on top of both um, a higher level of, of, of abstraction, essentially. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show snippets of all these um, files starting from csr.h all the way up to main. And essentially, it's looking at how to get a transmit working on the, um, the LoRa dongle. So starting with the csr.h, um, yeah, so you can see from the top left, that little section just sets up the CSR base um, address value on the wishbone bus. And then, um, yeah, the, sub the subsequent um, functions and addresses all relate to that. So you can look at the GPIO. This is just an example of how the LEDs is written. This is actually the entirety of the LED um, section for the CSR bus. Um, yeah, there's just those two functions that just read and write the CSR address. So when implementing in the, your own application code, all you need to do is just call LEDs out read or LEDs out write. Same thing can be seen there with the SPI section. Um, this section just shows the MOSI and MISO registers as well as the chip select. Um, it's the same situation. It's just uh, all you need to do is call the specific functions for the registers that you want to interact with. Um, yeah. So working our way up from the, on the LoRa radio side of things. So this is just a snippet of the, um, the HAL writes. So essentially what this function does, it writes um, SBI to the LoRa chip um, over the MOSI um, line. Um, yeah, so you can see that at the top, the inputs and the outputs have been determined already by Semtex. So all you need to do is use those and transmit it to um, the LoRa chip using whatever functions that are applicable to your microcontroller or um, CPU. And yeah, in this case, because it's uh, using Litex, there's all those Litex generated CSR functions. Um, all it does is just sets up the SPI communication. So those two for loops are basically um, writing to the MOSI register, the relevant bytes and then transmitting them. The read function is also the same, how read. Um, it's just that as as opposed to um, writing the MOSI register, you're reading the MISA register. Uh, moving on, uh, there's now the Semtech provided um, main driver file. Um, and I've just uh, highlighted two sections that um, show the write register and read register functions. The file is actually extremely huge and it essentially has, well, every command that's um, stipulated in the data sheet, which is, which is nice. You don't have to write any of that. But uh, you can see I've highlighted that um, these commands use the how write and how reads that we looked at in the previous slide. And essentially every function in this file um, ends with using one of those two functions. So you can see how they've had a good way of abstracting um, how you'd be able to write and read um, from the lower chip. So yeah, this is um, a write register. So it just writes um, whatever value that you want into the register on the lower chip. Um, yeah, moving on here is the radio.c. Now this is the wrapper that I um, wrote on top of the driver. And this section just shows a transmit code, um, which essentially um, is the steps that are needed to be taken in order to transmit um, via LoRa using the port. And yeah, you can just see it sets up the transmit LED, turns it on, and then it prepares buffers, configures to transmit, and then sets to transmit. Um, and then those functions are also showed there um, below. And what they are is just using the, the files in the driver that Semtech provided um, using the function, sorry, and uh, calling them. And yeah. Um, and then in main.c, this is now just the user application code, um, just sending a ping. Essentially, you set the message and then you initialize the various things in the main function. And then in the while loop, all you do is, if you're transmitting, you just call the, the transmit function that I, I showed in the previous slide. Um, so yeah, it's I think it's a good level of, of abstraction from um, the lowest level up until the main function. And that's essentially how you um, transmit yeah, using the port. So I'm now going to show a quick demonstration. Um, 
of the transmit being picked up by the spectrum analyzer. And it's just a video. Um, if this was in person, I had a, a better demonstration to show, which was um, the ping, um, pinging from one lower dongle to the other. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, make it in person. So this is um, the next best thing of a demonstration. So, yeah. So this is a spectrum analyzer. It's not picking up any signals right now. And then I connect the lower dongle and it turns on. Um, and I don't know if you can see it, but the LED is flashing. And then we go back to the spectrum analyzer and you can see that there's a peak at the transmit frequency. So just to make sure that um, it wasn't any way with signals, I disconnect and yeah, there's no peak. And um, yeah, so this was actually the first time I was able to um, get transmit working and I was quite excited, um, yeah. Okay, so I do have some documentation. Um, it's not thorough, it's not complete, but it's enough to essentially get the board manufactured, um, build the SOC, and then start writing programs on it. So it's uh, it's an interesting um, website. It's live now already. You can go click the link and you can just read more about it. Um, yeah, you can see I have a getting started. This just focuses on installing um, tool chains or um, Litex as well. And yeah, things like that. And then this, this tutorial as well is starting off from nothing into getting Blinky working on the LED. Um, yeah, so future plans. Um, this is both for um, my immediate completion. Um, so by the end of this year, um, and then also beyond, like moving further into um, the lower dongle lifespan. So, well, firstly, as I mentioned that, uh, actually I'm not sure I did, but the second prototype was actually only received like last week. So I've only only had a few days to play with it, which was getting that transmit working in the demonstration. Um, so it's still in the early stages of testing. There's still a lot of testing that I would want to do. Um, and that uh, covers um, specifically CPU related things. So things like latency, how long it takes to transmit messages, um, how long the computation takes to do that, um, bandwidth and throughput, how much you can actually, how much data you can send in a given time. Um, range testing, I plan to see how far I can actually transmit because I know LoRa is supposed to be um, long range. Um, so I want to see the capabilities of my PCB. That's also um, both line of sight and obstructed. And then as well as indoor testing, um, buildings, um, indoors, um, multiple stories or multiple rooms. And then finally benchmarking of the SOC. So that's just seeing um, how performative it actually is. And then ultimately, I would love to connect to a LoRaWAN gateway um, that's already implemented somewhere in um, the world. And then that would be connecting to the LoRaWAN network. Um, and then with the testing um, done, um, I've actually compartmentalized the um, plans for the LoRa dongle into three main goals. So the first one would be for well, my immediate goal for both finishing my dissertation and also just um, excitement of improving the um, PCB. So that's improving the SOC, which um, essentially um, making it more efficient, you know, use, giving it more computational using the FGA fabric. Um, and yeah, just improving that in general. And then moving on, I'd want to be able to run Linux on it, um, on the lower dongle, but that's a bigger um, endeavor and that's because it would need a, a larger FGA. There are, there are examples of Litex running Linux, like it's been done before I actually used it on a dev board. Um, but yeah, being able to do that on the lower dongle would, as I mentioned, require a much larger FPGA. And therefore that would mean um, redoing the whole board. So yeah, that's like more of a long-term goal. Um, but I do think it would also do much better in terms of contributing to edge computing. And then finally with that done, it would be seeing it being used in the in, in industry. Um, so as, as, as I mentioned with the demonstration of the gas sensor, just um, having a LoRa capable board um, um, for ease of pickup and use. So if somebody is like, uh, wants to have an application and they want to um, rapidly integrate LoRa, they can just take the board and then use it. And the added benefit is um, increasing um, computational capacity as well. But um, 
yeah, that's that's my presentation. I just want to thank you once again for uh, taking the time out to uh, come and see it and hear it. I apologize for not being able to be there. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to ask any questions, if you want to contact me, these are the links. Um, LinkedIn email, and then I have personal portfolio type website as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for um, attending. Bye-bye.